Today's broadcast is brought to you by Kidum. Kidum is a standards-based platform helping teachers personalize learning. With Kidum, teachers can gain access to an unlimited library of content with beautiful, actionable reports. And the best part is, Kidum is free. Visit them today over at kidum.co to learn more. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for making the Tech Educator Podcast part of your weekly professional development. We have a great show today. I have our, on one of our co-hosts, Miss Jennifer Judkins. Jennifer, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Great. Having a great day. Enjoying the sunshine. That is fantastic. It's certainly been a great day. We took the kids to the Renaissance Fair, had a great time out there with some friends and saw uh, that they got a chance to experience human chess. And that is an amazing thing to see out there. We saw a lot of jousting and swords and had a good time. Want to give a shout out to our audience members. We had Rob come out to the Ren Fair and had a good time with him for that. So check out all that great stuff here. I just realized that we were only a few miles away from the New York Renaissance Fair. But enough about all that great stuff. Today we're going to be talking all about Google Classroom. And there's been a lot of neat changes that have been happening over the summertime with Google Classroom. And today we're going to be talking to two amazing developers of Google Classroom add-ons and did you know that there's extra functionality coming to your google classroom for this school year jen you use google classroom don't you absolutely what are some of those key things that you work with teachers on when introducing them to google classroom so um usually we first just get teachers up and running by setting up their classroom some some important tips when teachers are new to classroom is to um, set your classes up in the order backwards of the way you want them to display. So teachers that have multiple classes, if they have a period A, B, and C, they want to set up C, B, and A because classroom tiles appear um, in that order um, opposite. So, um, so setting up classes in the opposite order that you want them to show on your screen and having individual classes set up for each section that you teach are some of the tips that I give teachers when they're just getting started. Um, what's I, what I love is that teachers can be up and running in classroom in a matter of minutes and, and their students get acclimated to it very quickly as well. So it's uh, a wonderful tool because it becomes sort of a great jumping off point for so many great things teachers can do in their classroom. And having that central hub is really helpful. I, I'm glad that you just said that, the term central hub. And that's exactly how I look at Classroom. Most people say, is it my website? And, and I, I'm one of those, I don't believe Google Classroom is your website. I believe that it is a, a to-do list. I believe it's an agenda. I think everybody needs to have a website. Website. We're going to talk about ways to, to integrate those things today. And, and really today, we are going to be talking about how to use it as that centralized location. We have 10 ways that we're going to be using Google Classroom today. And I want to introduce our guests as we go through here. I want to introduce Rob Drabkin from Open Ed. Ron, how are you today? Welcome to the show. I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Open Ed. Oh, well, uh, I, I won't tell you too much about myself because it's pretty dang boring. Uh, we're the, the company OpenEd.com, we're the leading uh, aligned K-12 resource library. So we take the best quality uh, videos, games, assessments for, uh, we currently have Common Core, Next Generation Science, New York Social Studies, uh, Texas, we support Texas, and many more. And uh, we're actually now, uh, as of just recently, we're a division of the ACT, the American College Test. So us Californians are now a large Iowa-based nonprofit. That is fantastic. And I'm interested in learning about some of the things that OpenEd is, is being used for. I know that there are some pretty cool features that I see a lot of uh, people talking about on Twitter. I want to hold that for somewhere in the middle of the show. But Ron, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Also on the show today, we have Krishna Vedetti, I believe. I want to say that the right way. Krishna, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on the program. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You are from a fantastic company called Tinker. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Tinker. Um, Tinker is a, uh, an online platform for educators to teach coding to kids in schools. Um, we also provide um, interactive courses for parents to enroll their children um, to learn you know, programming and use it in, in, in really interesting ways to become makers. Um, you know, our age group starts from all the way from, you know, 
first grade to all the way to uh, eighth grade today. Um, and our, the, the software we provide, the curriculum and tools that we provide for educators um, enable them to not have any programming experience yet to be able to teach coding. You know, I love the fact that Tinker and Google Classroom are helping kids in the programming and coding. Jen, there's so many different ways that we can discuss Google Classroom, and, and we're going to slice it up 10 different ways today. But let me ask you this. When somebody says to you for the first time, what is Google Classroom? I know that answer has changed over the years. What is your first word? What is that way you describe Google Classroom to somebody? Um, I tell them that it's a jumping off point for all of the digital things they want to do with kids. Um, I think what, what happens often with teachers is they get a little overwhelmed with all of the different places that we want kids to be in the digital world. And for younger students especially, uh, and for teachers who are very cognizant of every minute of classroom time, they don't want to lose time trying to write websites on the board, get kids logged in. And so Classroom provides very easy and quick access, not only to the things that teachers may offer up to students, but also um, some of these other wonderful tools that are available can be accessed very readily through Classroom as sort of a gateway into all of these great um, opportunities for students to learn in the digital space. And so one of the things that we use Google Classroom for is to give assignments. And one of the ways that we can give assignments is by utilizing those great things that are in Google Drive. Jen, what is one of the ways that we can use Google Classroom and Google Drive together to help out our students? So what's really amazing about Classroom is, and, and when, I, when I talk to teachers about other platforms for student learning and student management, um, when we talk about the Google integration of some platforms, it's there is nothing that comes close to the way in which Classroom integrates with the Google platform. So in Classroom, when you are pushing out assignments, what's amazing is that you have an option to push those assignments out in a way that, um, that you control. So what confuses teachers sometimes with Google products is the sharing feature. And so it, it kind of eliminates all of that um, confusion when you're able to share your, I'm just going to pull this up here, but when you're able to push out an assignment and choose the way in which um, students have that assignment shared with them. So what's fantastic is yes, you can click and navigate into Drive to grab a specific assignment, but the, what, what it allows you to do is either just give kids edit uh, view access to the file, or they can also have the ability to edit the same file simultaneously. And there are times at which you may want to do that, um, where all the students are maybe contributing to a shared document. But more often, teachers want it, each student to have their own copy that they can edit. And historically, teachers have had kids make their own copy and then share it back with them. But... The beauty of Classroom is that teachers can make a copy for each student and the sharing is done automatically and the organization within Google Drive, both for the teacher and the students, is all handled automatically. So it, it allows kids and students to focus on the learning and not the tech part of of the classroom. You know, I'm so glad that you brought all of that up. And, and, and Ron and Christian, let me bring you in on here. I, I do have to ask the question that everybody seems to ask when discussing classroom. Do you guys as developers consider Google Classroom a learning management system? <laughs> That's such a great question. What do you think? Well, you know, some people will say it is, some will say it's not. Um, in my mind, it's it's really not. I mean, it's got some of the features of, a, of an LMS, but LMSs are going to go a lot, lot deeper into features. Kristen, do you agree with that? I mean, yeah, I agree with that. I think it's it kind of simplifies the you know workflow between the student and the educator, um, you know, from the learning perspective, and also enables educators to manage their, you know, rosters and things like that. But I think, you know, it's not a full-blown LMS, but some of the code functionality of what a daily daily needs of 
teacher students need is kind of available to Google Classroom. So it's kind of, that's why a lot of educators are like picking this up and using it uh, and to integrate their daily workflow. And, and I, I, I have to say, I agree with you guys. I mean, if you're comparing this to the haiku, de uh, the, you know, the haikus and, and, and the canvases and all those different, you know, true LMSs, it's not there. I don't think it can be there. I don't know if I don't really know if Google's going to be pushing it there. But the one thing that you can do to set this apart is start to use some of these integrations differently. For instance, Jen, uh, let me bring you back in here. When we're looking at creating these assignments and we're looking at integrating things like Google Docs and Google Slides, how can we use these as not just word processors and PowerPoint substitutes, but how can we really take these two applications, turn them on their side, and integrate them into our lessons? So, you know, one of the major differences that separates the Google apps from more classic word processing and presentation tools is really that collaboration feature. And as a teacher, that's huge for me. I want kids working together and I want them doing that in real time. So something as simple as I can assign a presentation to a third grade, a group of third graders. You know, I can work with really young kids where um, I create a presentation in Google Slides and each kid's name is on an individual slide. And then I share that out through Classroom to the whole class so they can all edit the same slideshow. And that's a great introduction to students on that collaboration feature, how what it looks and feels like when kids are in a, a file simultaneously and each student can go to the slide with their name on it and maybe share something about themselves as a way to introduce themselves at the beginning of the school year or share something they did over the weekend. Um, but one of the important things I tell teachers when they're first introducing students to the idea of collaborating in a document is to help students have a specific space that they're working in so that everyone's not writing in the same um, exact spot on the document. So slides, for example, is a great one to start collaborating with because you can easily separate slides out for kids and have one assigned uh, to each of them by name. And I love that feature. Um, I, I, I like doing a presentation called 30 Different Ways to Use Google Slides in the Classroom. And it's 30 ways to not think of it as a PowerPoint substitute or, you know, slides and, and presenter. And, you know, I show off you can use slides for things like animations and for greeting yeah. cards and certificates. And there's so many different ways that you can integrate classroom and slides. I even saw, I don't know if you caught this one, but Richard Byrne from uh, Free Tech for Teachers did a really awesome video on how to use a Google Doc. You turn it into a template and then you embed that into Padlet as a background and then you embed the Padlet or you link the Padlet to Google Classroom. So you're integrating all of these different apps all at the same time. I'll see if I can find that link uh, when we're putting out the show notes for here. But it was just a neat way of doing things. I even saw the other day somebody had put out a video of how to embed a Google video, how to embed a YouTube video onto a Google Doc. But he did it through embedding it into slides first. So that way it showed on the slides. And then he did a copy and paste into drawings. So that way now in drawings, it's clickable and playable. And then he embedded the drawings into Google Docs, which is like five different steps to, to make it happen. But it's possible. And there's a lot of different things that you can do with Google Docs, with Google Classrooms, with these add-ons. Ron, I want to bring you back in here. Open Ed is doing some amazing things. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that Open Ed is doing that integrates with the, uh, the Google apps and uh, especially Google Docs these days. Oh, uh, well, we just launched a new add-on uh, for Google Docs. So uh, how many teachers out there will actually uh, do their lesson plan in a Google Doc? I would say, do you have any idea? Say that one more time. What percentage of teachers are actually keeping their lesson plans in a Google Doc these days? I would say a good majority of. I know with myself, whenever I train people on Google Docs, I suggest everybody put stuff in Google Docs. That way you can copy and paste it into whatever program that you're using. But I, I, I know where you're going with this, and I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah. And uh, so we just launched about a week and a half ago. A, uh, an add-on lesson plan tool for docs. And what it lets you do is it just, uh, I don't know how many 
few people have used uh, the Google Docs add-ons. It's free in the Chrome store. And uh, when you do this, you, it pops up a search button within your Google Doc, and you can find quality aligned resources. Hit one button and put them right into your lesson plan. You don't even have to go outside of your Google Doc to find uh, the quality resources for your students. Could you show us how that works? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I think I just share my screen here, yeah? Yep. My screen. And while he's doing that and getting that set up, we have a very, very live audience over here on teachercast.tv. We have questions going on. We're sharing links back and forth. I see Jen's in the chat. I see Rob and Peggy and Peg and Tina. If you have any awesome tips about Google Classroom, please check it out. And if you're listening to this in your car, maybe driving to work or something, we are live here every single week doing live professional development. Um, check us out. We are the Tech Educator Podcast. Uh, how are we doing there, Ron? Uh, do you see my screen yet, Jeff? I do. There it is. You see it there. Take it away. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, Google Chrome Store. And you can see right here, do you see the lesson plan tool for Docs? Yep. Yep. So uh, you can see here, I'll show you how it installs. It installs in about 20 seconds, but you can see the, the lesson plan in the Google Doc here, and you can see the search window right here. And uh, you simply add it to your Google Docs. And, oh boy. <laughs> Are you still hearing and seeing me, Jeff? No, we're all good. Okay. And, you know, while you're loading up here, I'm noticing some of the people that are on our teachercast.tv chat room have already been using this, and they're raving about it, which is really, really cool. So um, I see that you have an untitled doc here. Yeah, you title your doc, and uh, my computer's not behaving very well. Okay. But uh, basically, you see the add-ons button here? Yep. There it goes. You say add-ons, lesson plan tool for docs, and start. Okay. You still with me, Jeff? Yes. Okay. Right. So here you can see I'm still in my Google Doc, but if I want to go into, say, I'm teaching Common Core Math today, and I want to pop down a uh, tree. I'm looking for elementary school students. And now all of those and options there are given to you from the add-on, correct? That's correct. Yep. And if I want to say, uh, you know, like uh, counting, for example, I will get videos, quizzes, games, interactives, all these things. You can look at them or you can simply add them right to your Google Doc. And there it is. And it gives you a link to that. Where, where does that link go? And the link will go to a, a page on uh, Open Ed here. And I bet you can guess what I'm going to say once you're into this video. Abracadabra? Well, there's that. Oh. <laughs> but share on Google Classroom. Ah, wow. So once you find the video you like, you hit share on Google Classroom. And you'll see it's very quickly going to pop right into your uh, your classroom as an assignment. Now, Ron, let's be honest here. That probably cost the teacher some money, right? Uh, no, this is, uh, this is free. This is free. Jen, you know, I got to uh, tell you, P P ed tech companies like, 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 like Open Ed here are finding more and more reasons to not use tech coaches. It is really, really easy to use this. Yeah. I love it. I, I feel like the best tools are ones that don't require directions. And when I knew we were having open ed on here, I'm familiar with the site, but I was totally unfamiliar with the new add on. And Ron, I am so impressed with how clearly, um, you know, it steps you through each, each part of the process of using it. I, it reminded me, Jeff, a little bit of the research tool in Google. Um, docs where it appears on the side and you can search and when you click it populate, you know, it puts it right oh, yeah. in the document. You know, I, I just thought it was fantastic. I was thinking about that. It, it's just like the research tool, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic. I have, um, I have talked to teachers before about um, a digital plan book because it was one of the last um, paper holdouts for me as a teacher. 
I, I gave up paper when it came to many, many things like my grade book, like that, that I, I was very happy to go to a spreadsheet, but um, when, but there was something about having that paper handbook, uh, that paper plan book that I loved. Um, but I also hated because every time there was a snow day, I had to erase everything and move it, you know, but um, I, I find that the more as a teacher, I use digital resources like um, media resources, for example, the more helpful it is for me to have a digital uh, plan book so that I can have those links readily available because it doesn't work to write those down in a paper plan book. So um, I'm finding more and more teachers using a digital plan book and many ask me, well, what should I use? And I often say, well, you can just use a Google Doc because you can hyperlink everything and you don't have to worry about paying a subscription fee as you might have to for many of the digital plan books that are out there. So um, this is a, a great tool for teachers and it makes it really easy for them to search by just typing in the topic. I thought it was great, Ron, when I was playing around with it that you could easily search by topic. Now, Ron, is that Thanks, is that national standards, state standards, tech standards? What what is that actually allowing a teacher to look up and utilize? Well, you can imagine that our goal is within the next year to cover every state standard, uh, and we have plans for that. But currently, we've got um, well, we've got all of Common Core, we've got all of uh, Texas, Next Generation Science, we've got social studies from New York and California, and uh, we're adding frantically as we go, but. Unfortunately for, for us, it's a lot of hard work because states keep coming up with new standards all the time. <laughs> but we're on it. And, and one more time, and I, 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 I feel like I'm the guy doing OxyClean here. What is the price of that, of that add-on, Ron? It is free. Very, very cool. Now, Jen, there are some pretty neat things that you can do with docs, with slides. One of the things that I'm noticing teachers aren't familiar with is the fact that when you create a Google Classroom, it's automatically creating a calendar that goes into it. And you now have that calendar as a teacher. Your students have that calendar as a teacher. But really, that calendar can be used for so much more than Google Classroom, can't it? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that teachers struggle with is that um, the aware, you know, making parents aware of when assignments are due in the classroom environment, because at least as of today, um, there is no parent portal or or way in which parents can be kept informed of assignments posting on classroom. Um, but what you can do is you absolutely can keep parents in the loop by using the calendar feature. So what happens in classroom is, and I will share my screen just to um, make this a little easier to visualize, but um, what happens in classroom is that you can, um, you can set up, once you, from, from the moment you create your class, this is a um, this is on calendar. So when you create a class, it actually in your calendar, it actually creates a, a new calendar with that class. So for example, here's a classroom calendar. Well, let me turn it on. Um, the problem is it's the summertime and I'd have to go back. But mm -hmm. on the left hand side where it shows your calendars, the the name of your class will show on the side here. Now, let me um, stop you right there, Jen. With that with that name, that obviously comes from your classroom. Can you yeah. change the name of that calendar? And if so, does that now change the name for all of your students? So I, you know what? That's actually a great question. I, You Ooh. can change the name of it and it would, it would change it for everyone, I would think. But have you played with that, Jeff? I normally just leave it as a default, what my classroom name is. But you can change the name of any calendar. I was just playing the game called Stump the Tech Coach. I don't. I didn't know Does that. Change it just for you. Yeah. So okay, if you if you know the answer, you got to tell me. I don't. I don't know the answer. I be, because because <laughs> I, I I look. I mean, I've worked with teachers and now that we're migrating into google calendar they're looking at this going what is this thing and i'm like that's what you called your classroom oh right. Right. and and and, and yeah, that I, being I, said how does a parent know what that means 
So can the parent yeah, change no, the name I would or something? Think that you could change it, but that'd be something I'd have to. I mean, I know you can change the name of it. What I don't know is if it would display that way for everyone. I'm right. a little unsure about that. You know, the same way that you can put a Google Doc anywhere in your drive and it doesn't matter to the rest of the world, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I go ahead. That's a good question. But what's really nice is with any calendar, um, this is not exclusive of, um, of Google uh, Classroom calendars, but with any calendar, you have um, the ability to share that calendar as a public link so that anyone can access and view the events on the calendar. So I, um, I'll i share in the chat and we'll share in the show notes. I put together a tutorial video about this very thing so that teachers could, for example, embed the calendar um, in like their website or, you know, a lot of times teachers have teacher pages within their school's website. So that way parents can see. And the way that it works is any assignment that you put in Whatever the due date is on the assignment, the due date is what determines the date on the calendar. So if something is due on September 1st, then it will show as an event on the calendar for September 1st. So that way parents and, and the title of the assignment becomes the title of the event. Now, with all of this comes the calendar permissions. Uh, I'm not sure if you said that already. But could you talk about the, making the calendar? Does the, does the calendar come open to the world because automatically by making the calendar, it's shared between you and your students? Or do you need to so, go into those shared settings? So in, in terms of the students, the calendar is shared with the students automatically by virtue of them being part of Google Classroom. And so you're going to so, see 30 students under share with specific people? Um, it does not show individual students. Um, let me think, let me show an example. Um, so it's under calendar settings under share this calendar. So it doesn't show individual students. Um, oh, I see. So it, it makes yeah. it look like it's a, a groups.google or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't actually list the kids. But they can't make any changes to events. They're only seeing the events. But if you want to make it public with parents, you'd actually have to. I don't know if you can see this clearly. Yep. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Nope, we're good. But they would have to, under the settings menu, um, which appears to the right of the name of the calendar on that left-hand sidebar, they would choose share this calendar. And then they would need to make this selection that says make this calendar public. And typically the default is see all events and details because you want parents to be able to see not just that it's a busy event. You want them to see the name of the assignment. So again, I'll share in the, um, in the chat and we can put it in the show notes. I actually have a little tutorial video about this. If anyone wanted to do this for themselves to make the calendar available for parents to see. Excellent. So, while we're looking at all of this nice ed tech stuff, I want to bring Krishna back in here and talk a little bit about Tinker. Tinker is an amazing um, set of tools program for coding programming. Krishna, how is Tinker and Google Classroom working together to help students out? So as part of um, um, the coding, we provide um, curriculum and lesson plans. I mean, some of them is, so Tinker is, uh, it's a premium model. It's get started, anything, get, anybody can get started for free. We provide uh, all the tools for free. Teachers can build their own lessons. You know, any number of classrooms can be created for free. Any number of students can be there. The only time, um, you know, schools or uh, pay us is when they ask us for extended curriculum that will provide great specific curriculum and STEM lesson plans that uh, integrate coding with uh, uh, science, art, and math, and English subjects. Uh, so the way we do is that because it's, um, you know, all the content is designed as lesson plans, um, if a teacher has a Google Classroom and when they sign, when they come, they can actually come into Tinker and don't have to sign up, they just sign in using a Google login button and the Tinker automatically detects uh, that the teacher, particular teacher has a classroom and they can link the classroom with Tinker. So all of a sudden, 
A teacher can you know, send a lesson to all the students in the classroom. So the workflow is seamless at that point. So I don't have a live demo, but I'm going to share a video with you that showcases all this uh, uh, and the messages. So you know, it, it makes it so as soon as the teacher, teacher can assign a lesson, they can assign a project to look at, they can assign you know, a, a tutorial in a lo lots of interesting artifacts that live in Tinker. And the, uh, the students see them see that in there as as they log into the classroom, they see it in their timeline. And if they fin if it's if it's an assignment, if they end up uh, finish finishing up that lesson or a project, and the teacher immediately knows what happened because there's an automatic assessment going assessment is going on behind the scenes. The tinker does not just saying notification that students have finished the lesson, but also analyzes the data and say they have. They're able to master some concepts, and, and, and so the kind of deep assessment goes on behind the scenes. Um, you know, so today more than um, you know seventy thousand or so schools across uh, U.S. and Canada use Tinker, and more than I think uh, Google has asked us uh, how many domains. There's more than twenty thousand domains use Tinker. Um, not all of them are classrooms because you know the classroom is uh, a new concept and the so a lot of teachers are getting onto Classroom, but a lot of Google domain accounts are using uh, Tinker already. Are you able to give us a quick demonstration or show us how this works? So I don't have a demo set up, unfortunately, because I got here late, but I've, I've shared a video on the speed here. Okay. That um, I, 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 I kind of typed it on the message to everyone in the call. I don't know if you're able to see my YouTube link. Um, so what we can do on that uh, is to put that in our show notes, and we yeah. will certainly make sure that that gets out in our post. Or posts, of course, go out either Monday or Tuesday morning, and of course we will make sure that all of that information and show links and all that stuff gets put in there. But you know, it really is a neat thing that you know most people look at classroom, and I even say myself, it's not a learning management system; it's a document management system. But when you're adding all of these extra things, the tinkers, the pair decks, the open edge the all of these it's no longer just a document managing system it really is a you know it, it's like a learning management system i guess but you're redefining the term learning because it, it really is encompassing all of this stuff um jen I, you know you've been around from the days when classroom came out what is classroom now three years old and three year years now. four years something like that and and there's just so many things that it can do and that it's it's now being able to do as we go through here. Um, let me ask you guys, you know, Krishna, Ron, where are you guys going with Google Classroom in the future? Are there things that might be coming out that haven't been announced, haven't been released? Um, that, that, you know, is there a direction that you guys might know that Google Classroom is headed in? I think anything they they say is a good idea. We tend to jump on, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, the thing that we did with them just recently is that the uh, the automatic marking of done not done. So uh, that went live in the last. Uh, well, they announced it at ISTE, but um, yeah. So now when these assignments are given to students, uh, uh, you know, open ed assignments are given into a classroom. The student finishes it in open ed and then updates done not done right away automatically in classroom. So that's just one example of, of uh, things that we're doing with them. And Krishna, where, where do you see Tink? Yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, to the same, uh, we, we, we are working with them to make it uh, extremely seamless. Right now, you know, teachers will be able to send, uh, you know, a lesson for a student to learn, or they might send an assignment for them to complete and submit um, and so all that, you know, um, you know, the, uh, the complete loop be between assigning a task to students all the way to knowing what they, whether they've finished or not. Um, so Google is looking at, they're asking us, I mean, not just us, um, all the developers, what are the kind of features that we should be uh, looking at? So we, we are trying to make sure that, you know, there are a few dialogues that pop up, you know, even when you integrate, like, you know, if you want to seamlessly, so one, one for example, if the teacher ends up, um, you know, adding new students um, to the existing classroom and application providers like us have to kind of ask the teacher to resync sometimes, meaning that we have, they have to click on one button, so resyncs the roster. 
So we're trying to make sure that Google can give us behind the scenes APIs, which they're working on, so the syncing happens automatically. So both the application providers like OpenAd or Tinker automatically have you know, classroom changes reflected versus having to ask the teachers to do one more thing saying that, okay, you know, there's a change happen, you might want to resync the roster. So some of those smaller things, I think they'll go out and they, they'll, they'll go fix. And then over time, perhaps, you know, there are, right now it's at the classroom level, maybe perhaps they might come back. I and mean, I'm not saying it's in their plans, they might be able to do it for the school level, you know, or, you know, or maybe at a district level, who knows? So, so that um, they, they might be a higher level console that manages multiple uh, student rosters at, in a simplified way and reduce task load for teachers. You know, what that I'm- might be a great question for Jennifer about district level support with Google Classroom, since you're a tech enabling person. What do you think about that, Jennifer? Um, so the so the question, Ron, is about how the so can you help me understand what were you asking about? I'm I was in the middle of tweeting out. I'm sorry, I didn't miss the whole thing. <laughs> Not at all. No, uh, I think what what Krishna is uh, hinting at is that you know the initial uh, way of that apps integrated with Google Classroom was hey sync your roster teacher and the teacher yeah. would hit sync right. And we started to been here. We started to hear like uh, district technology people like yourself who will say, hey, we just want to sync up the whole district. <laughs> and- uh, The entire school for-, for you know. Or school, or, yeah. I, I'm curious your thoughts, uh, your professional thoughts on that. So I, I'm finding, uh, the, the thing is that there's um, a lot of sites that are supporting like the sign in with Google, which is a huge help mm -hmm. to us. And it's almost functioning like a, kind of like a single sign on opportunity. So those are the kinds of things we tend to look for where students have to maybe click in to create an account, but that that's very seamless for kids because they have Google Apps accounts. So in that way, I, I think it's less of an of a need for us to control that on on our side as far as, you know, creating accounts for students on, you know, at the district level when when there's so many sites now that are supporting the sign in with Google. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our preference when we can find those tools. We tend to lean towards those because they allow our kids to create their own accounts, but without having to worry about memorizing more login information. So as we're looking through this, I'm not sure if we're, we're there. Okay. So as we're looking through this, you know, the one thing that I look at when it comes to the future of Classroom is really the idea of going mobile. And, you know, if Google ever came out and said, what do you need? I'm looking at using the add-ons in the mobile app. Can you guys comment on the ability? I, I thought I might have heard that, that add-ons and Android were coming together. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Are we looking at the ability to use some of these add-ons on the mobile device? Does anybody well, know? Certainly, uh, I'm not sure. I think we could all have our own take on this, but certainly use on the Chromebook is uh, yes. predominant Yes. for the open ed uh, Google Classroom integration anyway. But on the phone? You know, we haven't seen too much of that. It just seems like Chromebooks are the predominant way of doing things. And is, is, is it not on the phone, do you think, just due to design choice? Is it a battery killer? Is it the apps are not made for third-party contributions? What, what do you think is what's is the one I thing? I think we'll it's also to do with students. You know, a lot of students in the, you know, if you look at perhaps the high school level, students might have uh, a mobile device, mobile phones, but you know, elementary and middle schoolers uh, predominantly end up, you know, logging from a tablet or a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the way I think about it when I talk with teachers and students is that a mobile device, you know, a tablet is is always going to give you sort of like I, I compare it to like an ATM versus a bank. You know, you can you, you're always going to get kind of the light version of whatever it is that you're using and. Um, just as you can do some things at an ATM, but you, you know, you can't do everything. You need to go to, into the bank for that. So 
I feel like mobile devices don't support a number of things that are kind of these additional things that supercharge the basic apps, you know, so you have even within Google, you know, Dai itself, there are, there are a number of features that are not supported natively in a, you know, that, that aren't even add-ons. These are just, you know, things like the research tool, Jeff, we were just talking about, like, that's not even something you're installing separate. That's, that's something that works just fine, but not on a tablet. So, um, and even the way commenting and chat and all of that stuff, it's, you know, it's just a little bit different. So I don't know that there's plans for that. It's always hard to know what they're going to, what they're going to come out with next, but I would be a little surprised if they were trying to push add-ons into the mobile market, you know, Chrome extensions, all of those things are kind of outside the realm of mobile devices, at least I, that seems to me. So over in our chat box, over on teachercast.tv, we're having a very, very healthy in, uh, discussion about some of the features that they would like. One of the features that I'm seeing them kind of talk a little bit about is a teacher being able to switch over to student view. Do you guys see a need for a teacher to see what the students are looking at versus presenting to the students, let's say, in teacher view? Is that something that we should be looking for? I think it would help teachers to have a student view. You know how, um, Jeff, we've been playing around lately with the new um, Google Sites uh, platform that's now in like early beta. It's fantastic. Um, I heard there's a great cheat sheet on it. I know. I know. Who spent all that time and made that fabulous cheat sheet? Um, no, what's, what's neat about that, for example, is um, uh, makes me think kind of in the same lines is when I view any um, site that I'm creating on the new Google Sites platform, I can toggle between a mobile device, a tablet, and a, and a computer, like a desktop view. And it's just really cool for me to be able to see what that experience looks like in those different formats. Um, I think it would be really great if Classroom had the ability for teachers to see how things appear for a student. The way that we work around that in our district is we have kind of a dummy account that we've created that's a student account in that it has the kinds of permissions that our students have. And then teachers are made aware of the login credentials for that and are able to, if they want to, to sign into that student account and add their class just to see what it looks like. Um, so that's, you know, something that we make available to our teachers. But I think teachers would have some peace of mind if they could sort of just with just a little, you know, view button, just toggle and see how a page appears to a student. I think that would also help when they're showing students how to use the site. Right. Because the, because the teacher view is slightly different and it would make it easier to um, instruct students, okay, here's, here's what your screen looks like, as opposed to it looks sort of like this, but a little bit <laughs> different. And, and, right, and so we have some different options here, right? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing this in our chat box. Somebody actually is using a teacher and a student account, which I'm assuming needs two logins so they can kind of go back and see. Other people are asking, you know, should... When you've got multiple teachers in a classroom, whether it be professional development reasons, co-teachers, should they be all listed as co-teachers or should you only have one teacher and a bunch of students? And, you know, I'd love to get all of your opinions on, on setting things up, especially in a professional development world. I know as a tech coach, I am integrated with several other teachers Google Classrooms, and I ask to be a student rather than a teacher, because if I'm a teacher, then I get all the emails when their students are, you know, sending things in and all, all those different emails, whereas if I'm just a student, I, I don't get so many emails. Jen, what's your philosophy when, when working with another teacher? Do you want to be a teacher in their classroom, or do you want to be a student in their classroom? So I always try to think about, well, what is, what is the purpose of that other person being in the room? So for example, uh, being, in, being in the classroom um, tool. So if it's a special educator, for example, that's supporting the classroom and needs access so that they can provide feedback inside of student documents, and when the student is outside of the classroom and in, say, maybe a support room, 
can they can they view all the assignments and also get in as a teacher would to be able to provide feedback then that would be a, a co-teacher if it's just a matter of um having an awareness like maybe it's a a support staff that just wants to know well what's due in this class and what assignments haven't been turned in um by my by this student then um you know they may just be viewing it over the shoulder of the student but but being like in a professional development environment when teachers are in a class together like i've done like book study groups with teachers that way um usually i just have them all join as a student i think it helps them to see what the student view looks like too it's kind of a great way for them to experience that but um they should um they should be getting notifications when new posts are made that way but inside of classroom you can turn those off if you choose not to receive those what you won't get as you mentioned jeff are notifications when people put assignments in so um if you're a, if you're a student and someone posts uh and and turns in an assignment you wouldn't get any notification but most people don't really want too many notifications. Mm -hmm. It's usually something they try to minimize. So we have clearly covered Google Classroom in a way that we've never really been able to. There's so many new things on here. I was trying to find the link a couple seconds ago for the episode that we did probably two years ago with Alice Keeler when she came on to talk about her book, 50 Ways of Using Google Classroom. It is by far my number one YouTube video. It's almost past 100,000 hits on it. There's so much interest in Google Classroom, and it seems like every single school year that just gets ramped up. Um, I want to say thank you so much to our guests for coming on here. Krishna, where can we find out more information about the great stuff that you're doing and find more information about Tinker? Um, I have uh, posted on that uh, that feed and also replied to uh, some of the uh, Twitter uh, feed. Uh, so I, I'm more than happy to kind of share it, send you an email with those links. I don't know how, what's the best way to share some of this information. For example, uh, Jennifer just uh, tweeted and I replied to her and I put a video on there um, and also on your current live chat screen, I've uh, posted a video as well. Sure. We will put all of the links in our show notes, which will go out once we post the, uh, the final edit of this show. But where, where, for, those who, for those who are listening, where can we find you? What's your website? What's your Twitter address? Uh, it's gotinker at G-O-T-Y-N-K-E-R. And website is T-Y-N-K-E-R.com. And then if they have a Google Classroom, just sign in using a uh, Google account and it'll automatically everything gets set up. And is everything on Tinker free for kids or is there a freemium model? How, how does it work if anybody just wants to go in and play with Tinker? It's a freemium model. Um, so all the tools and you know basic curriculum is all free for any number of students, any number of classrooms and teachers can make their own lessons. We do provide advanced curriculum and assessment for a, a fee at, at a classroom level and a school level. We also are the one of the biggest providers of hour of code content for um, so more than 30 million kids have used uh, tinker.com tutorials. They're all free every year in December. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of ton of free content out there and you know some schools and classrooms that want detailed lesson plans, uh, great specific lesson plans, they purchase from us. Very, very cool. Ron, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for helping get the show set up. Uh, where can we find out more information about the great stuff you're doing over at OpenEd? Oh, yeah, just simply over at OpenEd.com. Um, and that's it. It's, uh, it's free to browse, free to use almost all the resources. Um, it's, yeah, it's just all there. Fantastic. We'll, of course, have all of the links over here in our show notes. Jen, you have an amazing set of resources over at uh, teach for teach teachingforward.net is Th my site and um, i'm on twitter at jen judkin so j-e-n-n-j-u-d-k-i-n-s and of course we'll have all the links to that now jen we've waited this long we have a major major announcement that we're going to be talking about if everybody out there can just please relax sit down put the fire on 
We have a major announcement. We have been doing the Tech Educator podcast now for about 128 episodes. And we always come on at the beginning of the show and we say we are your Sunday night live professional development. Starting next month, I don't have the exact date yet, but starting next month, we are going to be moving to Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Set your calendar, subscribe to our calendar, and Peggy George, you can help me push that calendar out to even more people. But we are going to be moving to Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock. Um, this is a major, major shift for us, but uh, we just decided that it, we might have a, a a much greater chance at getting some amazing guests such as tonight. Um, but So we are going to be doing everything on Tuesdays at 8 o'clock. So Craig... That means you. You have to tell us what Twitter chats are during that time, okay? But uh, keep that in mind. Tuesdays at 8 o'clock, we are going to be moving the Tech Educator podcast. We will be here next Sunday, and for the next few Sundays, uh, we're going to take a little break again around uh, the holiday weekend uh, when, you know, for us, school starts after the holiday weekend. So once the holiday is over, we're going to be moving over to Tuesdays, probably the week after, my goodness, I can't remember. Is it Labor Day or Memorial Day? What, what are we at? I can never get these straight. Is it Labor Day? It's, I think it's Labor Day. It's yeah. Labor. I can never remember these two things. It's the one without the auto car race. The Monday I get off when school just starts. Yeah, I know. I, I know th th that Tuesday after Labor Day is my first day back. We are not doing a show then because I'm going to be swamped in professional development world. Probably the next week we're going to be starting back and we're going to have a full calendar with a lot of great stuff. We were able to pick up some, uh, some pretty cool guests that we met at ISTE and we're going to be having them on. Check all of that out. I also want to do a quick plug, not only for the great stuff over on GenSite, teachingforward.net, but we just released a brand new intro to Gmail online course, which you can find over at teachercast.net slash intro to Gmail. I've got 16 great videos, um, a whole SlideShare presentation on all the Gmail labs, and also uh, a full Google Slides presentation with all the cheat sheets and stuff. I do have to say that whole entire page is dedicated to Jen because she helped me get through the whole thing. But um, check all that stuff out. We'll have links to all of these things. We're going to be putting out two posts on tonight's show. We're going to be putting out the one with the actual show notes, which is what we usually do. And we're also going to be putting out a special uh, top 10 ways of using Google Classroom with a full-bodied blog post, all the links, all the paragraphs, which uh, Jen and I are working on as we speak. So check that out this week. And I hope you guys are having a great summer. We will be back next Sunday um, to talk about more things going on in the world of Google. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. Thanks so much, everybody.